Okay. Um, before we get started today, uh, first and foremost, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining today's event. Um, before we get started, I do want to go over just some basic ground rules and some reminders for today's session. Um, we are in a normal Teams meeting, so uh, attendees do have the ability to turn their camera on. We kindly ask that you keep your camera off uh, as today's sessions are being recorded. Uh, so if you do come on camera, uh, your face will then also be included in the recording. Uh, so we want to make sure our panelists or our moderator are front and center. Uh, so we do ask that you keep your camera off. Um, Microphones are also disabled throughout this panel session, uh, and that's where the chat will come in. So you'll see this button on your screen. Uh, that'll pop open the chat. You can feel free to ask any questions of the panelists or moderator, um, as well as if you need any tech support, I will be there to help. Um, after the panel discussion, there will be a Q&A section uh, where you'll be able to raise your hand, uh, and uh, I will individually turn microphones on so that you can ask your question. Keep in mind also you can just ask your question through the chat uh, and our chat moderators here will read the questions out for the panelists if you want to go that route as well. Um, and I know I said it before, but just a friendly reminder uh, that today's panel is being recorded. Um, so please, if you are not presenting, we'd ask that you keep your camera off. Um, I'm going to kick it right over to today's moderator, Monique. Uh, I will let you kind of set us all up um, and introduce the panelists. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Work Summit panel on building innovation hubs. My name is Monique Kirkendall Quarterman, and I serve as Executive Director for Kentucky Commercialization Ventures, where we partner with all of Kentucky's public universities and community and technical colleges to advance innovation across the state. I'm excited to serve as moderator today for an excellent group of panelists, including Alan Barubi, Senior Fellow and Deputy Director at the Brookings Institution, Tony Ellis, Executive Director for Kentucky Innovation and General Counsel at the Kentucky Cabinet for Economic Development, and Christine Tarquinio, Vice President of Talent, Workforce, and Brand Strategies at Greater Louisville Incorporated. To start us off, I'd like for each of our panelists to tell us a little more about their role and with, with innovation ecosystems and what's the coolest part of their work. I'm very fortunate to work with Tony often, and so I'll start with you, Tony. Would you like to tell us more? And Tony, I think you may be on mute. Okay, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, as, as Monique said, uh, I, I have the pleasure of working with her every day. Uh, my name is Tony Ellis. I am the General Counsel for the Cabinet for Economic Development and also the Executive Director of KY Innovation. So, uh my job and and it's cool factor well governor Bashir made encouraging innovation a top priority of his economic development strategy um, and has been really focused on kentucky's growth opportunity through innovation and developing our ecosystem uh through that he's got a couple goals that he's talked about repeatedly including expanding opportunities to capture all of the talent and growth potential of traditionally underserved areas uh building out industry clusters such as the successful Agritech cluster and growing our advanced, you know, and our, our growing advanced manufacturing cluster and creating a comprehensive statewide network that makes Kentucky attractive to startups and entrepreneurs. So the coolest part of my job uh, is that I get to work across our various public private partnerships, university partners and the community to implement these initiatives and execute that strategy. Um, we're not a rich state, but uh, we think we can achieve great things if we focus, work together, and use our public funds uh, efficiently. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those public-private interactions and, and people that I work with on a daily basis. One of the main ways that we support the uh, Kentucky innovation ecosystem is through our innovation hubs. We have six regional hubs throughout the state. Uh, they were selected through a competitive RFP process, uh, and they really act as the front door for entrepreneurs or potential entrepreneurs, startups, talent, university innovators, investors, corporations seeking to innovate and other stakeholders to get connected to the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, that's predominantly outside of the university. 
Inside the university ecosystem, we launched a new initiative called Kentucky Commercialization Ventures, which Monique is our incredible executive director of. Uh, they work directly within the university system to support innovation and tech transfer. Uh, it's a public private part. It's a broad community partnership with all of the public universities and institutes of higher education. Uh, it's really at the forefront of where this area is going nationally. Uh, we're very excited to have her there and they've already had some incredible successes. Uh, we also directly work with uh, the capital deployment. Kentucky has two different venture capital funds, Commonwealth Seed Capital and Kentucky, uh, the Kentucky Enterprise Fund, both of which focus on early pre-seed, seed and series A uh, investments. We've had those for about, at this point now, about 15 years. We're excited to see where they're going. And we also administer a number of tax credits, including the angel tax credit and the fund tax credit, which give incentives to investors to invest in those companies alongside our public dollars. Uh, our, our group at KY Innovation also manages the grant funds that we provide. So SBI or STTR matching funds for companies that go out and obtain federal grants. And we also provide a full range of services for those companies to help them get those grants. Uh, we also have a really interesting initiative that we launched recently where we're working directly with international startups and startup ecosystem support organizations to help those companies come in through the United States and start uh, selling products, manufacturing and growing in the United States through Kentucky. It's an initiative we just launched within the past two months uh, in collaboration with the chamber. We're already seeing a lot of leads come through that organization um, and expect our first people to be on the ground likely in the summer or early fall. Uh, and, and relevant to this summit, I'd say the coolest part of my job right now that we're doing with data and AI uh, is every, within the next few months, every Kentucky Innovation Hub and any partner within the Kentucky Innovation Enterprise will be collecting, sharing, um, and analyzing data. We've never had a real data-based approach through our entrepreneurial support activities. We're very excited to have that implemented. Uh, and we view AI as really the future of that process making it easier to gather the data, analyze it, and make recommendations, similar to the way that AI has already benefited industries like healthcare, manufacturing, autonomous vehicles. We're also making direct investments into growing and supporting our AI data analytics ecosystem. So this event uh, and other events that like it that we're having throughout Kentucky are really um, highlighting how strong our AI and data group is in Kentucky right now. You know, we had a thousand people last year. We're close to that number this year. We're excited to see the growth. We're excited to see, uh, you know, honestly, the excitement around the work that this community is doing. We see a number of corporations starting to get involved in the startup and innovation ecosystem, community partners like Louisville Metro government and other governments around the state, obviously the state government and the universities. Uh, and finally, we're really focused on metrics. There's never been a, a metric focus around the entrepreneurship work we're doing. But again, because we're not a rich state, we need to be really thoughtful about how we're spending our money and making sure that we're achieving results. And the results being that we're increasing the number of startups, increasing their growth, increasing the dollars invested into them, increasing the number of unicorns and companies that have successful exits, and then bringing that money back in to reinvest into our community. Um, so that's the coolest part of my job. I get to do that all day, every day, surrounded by great people um, and think about ways to position Kentucky to be strong for the next 20 or 30 years. Wonderful. Thank you, Tony. And I'll pass it over to Alan. Would you like to talk a little bit more about the work you do and what's the coolest part of your role? <laughs> sure. Thank you, Monique. Good to be with you all. Um, so the first thing I want to confess is that uh, I am not in Louisville. I'm not even in the Midwest. Uh, I'm here in Washington, D.C. in my house. Uh, but in normal times, I work at a public policy think tank uh, called the Brookings Institution. And within the institution, I work in the Metropolitan Policy Program, uh, where we research and advance policies and strategies that support inclusive economic growth in cities and in regions. And so my interaction with the innovation ecosystem in Greater Louisville has actually come about through a partnership that we have with the Future of Work Initiative and with Microsoft. Um, and specifically, I'm one of the authors of a report that we launched just yesterday. Here's the cover page. It's entitled, How Louisville Can Become a Stronger and More Equitable Hub for AI and Data Economy Jobs. 
Um, that is a mouthful of a title, uh, but what I hope folks see in it is that it is really a first of its kind analysis of where the Louisville region stands relative to its peer regions on measures of strength and potential on artificial intelligence and wider capabilities in the advanced use of data. So a reasonable question might be, uh, why is a DC think tank uh, looking at AI in Louisville? So I'd offer two uh, explanations and rationales for that. Uh, the first is that local leaders in Louisville actually really do realize that the ability of their residents to get good jobs, to start successful businesses, to enjoy a high quality of life depends on the region's ability through its workers, its companies, its educational institutions to take advantage of the latest technologies. And so they wanted to understand their starting point as well as some strategic directions that might make sense for the region. Um, and then the second is that at Brookings, We've actually spent many years in Louisville and communities like it uh, throughout the Midwest focused on how those places can become more vibrant and more equitable centers of economic growth for the United States. Um, for quite some time now, too much of the nation's capital and talent has been sucked up by too few of its cities, mostly those on the coasts, and that's really had negative effects on the nation's economic, political, uh, and social outcomes. So rebalancing that equation through newer hubs like Louisville, we think has to be a key national policy priority. So, you know, my interaction with the ecosystem came about through not just doing the research, but also uh, the degree to which it was informed through a collaboration with the Future Work Initiative, through Microsoft, but also a range of stakeholders in Greater Louisville that we had the chance to meet uh, both virtually and in person, uh, like public sector officials, community-based organizations, uh, leaders in the educational sector, universities, colleges, public schools, workforce training providers, um, large companies, as well as the startup community and growth companies. Uh, and then finally, intermediaries like uh, those that Tony's organization supports and that uh, uh, are really trying to bring together different sectors to create a more vibrant technology economy in Greater Louisville. And I think what um, what was exciting to me and cool to me in, in that effort was that across all of those different actors, I really saw a shared commitment to a common vision. Um, to make Louisville, yes, a hub for good jobs and artificial intelligence and the data economy, uh, but more than that, to also do it in a way that helps to close economic gaps that exist in Louisville, like a lot of other regions, by race and by place, uh, and also to do so in a way that adheres to values of fairness, reliability, transparency, accountability, um, what some call uh, AI for good. So I think in our conversation today, I have the chance to talk a little bit more about our findings and recommendations, but I think that's what brings me to the conversation. Thank you, Alan, great work. And Christine Turquinio, would you like to talk more about your role in the innovation ecosystem and what's really cool with your work? Sure, thanks everybody for having me today. And Alan, the report was fantastic. <laughs> um, so I'm Christine Tarquinio. Um, I work at Greater Louisville Inc., which is your Metro Chamber of Commerce. Um, my role uh, there is to oversee all of our talent attraction, retention, workforce development, marketing and branding for GLI and its affiliate networks, Tech First, and the Advanced Manufacturing and Logistics Network. Um, the kind of the coolest thing that intersects with, with innovative work that I'm working on is the Career Acceleration Network. This is really an innovative initiative that GLI is trying to raise up. Um, it hasn't really been done before, um, but we're trying to intentionally connect businesses to one another to create pathways for low skilled, low wage workers to be able to move from those positions into higher skilled, higher wage positions. So let's say you come into the network as a job seeker and um, you get a job as a housekeeping attendant at a hotel that pays $11 an hour. Um, you agree to stay in that position for up to six months, which reduces turnover that the hotel has for that role. So they see a benefit in that. While you're in that role, we're helping you get connected to training um, through our various workforce partners so you can upskill and reskill. And so let's say, you then are eligible to move into a front desk position at that hotel. So you've gone from $11 an hour to say $16 an hour. 
you stay in that position for another six months, continuing to, to upskill and reskill. Let's say you decide that you really have a penchant for coding. So you go through Code Louisville and at your graduation from Code Louisville, you can then move into a role with Louisville Geek, for example, where you're making $22, $24 an hour. So our goal is really to impact the workforce and help people to get to a livable wage. Great, thank you so much. I can see that we have a lot of um, similarities and also differences in the innovative perspectives that we hold. It makes me um, ask the question, what does a thriving innovation hub mean to each of you? I'm really interested to see um, what each of you uh, aspire for in your um, efforts to build uh, successful innovation hubs. Um, Tony, would you like to start on that question? Sure, I'm happy to. And and I should say, you know, we at the state level are very excited about the work Microsoft and the city um, and organizations like the Brookings Institute have done to come together and really support Louisville and support Kentucky to help grow our ecosystem. These are exactly the kinds of partnerships uh, we look forward to expanding in Louisville and throughout the Commonwealth. And and these are also the kind of partnerships and innovation events that we believe are the heart of a thriving um, and functioning innovation hub. If an innovation hub is working really, really well, um, we're gonna see people coming together naturally through clusters like the AI and data analytics cluster because they're excited about it, they wanna talk about it, and there's a lot of activity there. Uh, if, if an innovation hub is healthy, it's gonna operate really as a front door and entry point for anybody in the community looking to get connected to somebody else looking to learn about what's going on in a specific industry or in a specific startup, looking to get general information about incentives or programs that could be available to them to help them get started like the SBDC network um, and really operate as an air traffic controller. Um, and, and that's where we see our innovation hubs going right now. We're really excited about how they're coming together. I think one of the other things you'll see, um, at least from a statewide perspective of a healthy innovation hub, is that they're regularly communicating with each other throughout the state, sharing ideas, sharing companies, working together to create statewide programs. That's really the more that we can pass ideas and information between each other uh, and make those critical connections, I think the healthier we'll be as a state. Such a great point, Tony. Christine and Alan, would you like to add on? On advice for building successful innovation hubs? I'll, I'll go I'll go first and, and hopefully Christine will uh, be able to add. I think you know, this is probably a good time to sort of reflect to the audience what we saw as the key opportunities and challenges for Greater Louisville in building that stronger uh, innovation hub. So um, the methodology of the report was basically to look across a series of what I call kind of beta indicators for the strength, health and potential of the uh, AI economy in Greater Louisville. And I say beta because like this has never really been done before. So we were sort of taking what we could find in terms of uh, what was going on in the innovation sector, looking at talent, looking at the startup ecosystem and looking at the connective tissue across all of that and seeing where Louisville uh, benchmarked relative to uh, about 15 other sort of mid-sized cities throughout the Midwest and Southeastern United States. So there were sort of three headlines that I would put out there for consideration and discussion. The first was that we really did see that Louisville ranks lower than most of its peer regions throughout the wider Mid Midwest and Southeast on AI specific measures of innovation talent in the startup ecosystem. So there doesn't seem to be a great deal of activity yet at say the cutting edge of the technology economy. That said, the region does have this really considerable base of talent and companies in what we call the this wider data economy. So companies and positions involved in the use of big data, statistics, mathematics, and software, which we think provides a really important foundation for future growth in artificial intelligence. The second headline was that were the kind of key hurdles, like what's between greater Louisville and that sort of stronger, deeper, more equitable AI economy. So 
the first key hurdle is that a lot of that data economy that I'm describing seems to remain tied up in the very largest companies and institutions in the region, which we feel may be holding the region back from re reaching a real critical mass of talent and innovation that's not only right in the very big companies, but in the in, in the in the middle market and in the startup ecosystem. Um, and then the second and perhaps even more important uh, finding along these lines is that Louisville's data economy, such as it is, remains racially exclusive. And we saw that black residents were only half uh, in fact, less than half as likely uh, to work in data economy positions uh, as other racial and ethnic groups in the local economy. Um, third, despite these challenges, uh, we see Louisville, as I think Tony was just alluding to, having a stronger institutional landscape than many of its peer regions for addressing these challenges. So we feel like if it can actually collaborate to facilitate things like access to data at scale, training, capital, business development support. It has the right size. And I saw this in person, like you get together with these different communities and like people actually know one another. And I think that's a real plus compared to the big mega regions that sit at the forefront of the technology economy today. Um, and it has deep expertise in key clusters like healthcare to become, I think, a more powerful and equitable mid-sized hub for, for artificial intelligence. So uh, there, there's a lot of potential there, and I think it's worth flagging sort of what are the key things that Louisville really needs to focus on to emerge into that next tier. Alan, I couldn't agree more. I think that one of the biggest assets that we have is um, the long history of bi-state regionalism that we have in this area. Um, GLI works to support a 15 county region and just yesterday we had an event featuring Wendy Danchesser um, from across the river, our CEO Rebecca Flyshaker at Louisville Forward and Kelly Deering Smith at the Water Company. So regionalism has long been a focus of ours and I think it's something that really sets us apart from other, other communities. But from my perspective, it's very simple. Talent, talent, talent. <laughs> We, and most importantly, diverse talent. We have to find a way to upskill our existing talent um, so that we can solve the immediate needs that we have and fill the immediate gaps that we have. But we also need to be attracting talent so that we can solve not just um, for continued innovation, but also for future talent. We need those, those senior level people to come in and train the new people and be that those, those um, elements of excitement and innovation for there. And it has to be done through a lens of inclusion. I think that we all understand finally collectively for the first time that it's no longer acceptable for an us and them society. Um, the more people you have, the more perspectives you create, the better and more innovative of an environment you have and the stronger you are as a community. Thank you, Christine. I really appreciate um, that perspective because talent and skill development is a big piece of this, right? I think of the mentorship and allyship that helped drive my participation and eventual path and leadership within the ecosystem. Um, knowing people and being able to leverage network um, and skills play a really important role. Um, any others, any thoughts on um, the role of talent and skill development in growing a, a, an impactful hub? I mean, I could pick up where Christine uh, left off, I think, or at least take it up to the level about so how we think about it at Brookings. Um, you know, for us, ultimately, there is no factor that matters more to the long run economic success of a region than talent. So, uh, you know, the innovation economy in particular, it runs on human capital. It doesn't run on land. It doesn't run on physical capital. So you see, you know, I think as 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 Christine was just talking about from her perch at the uh, at the regional chamber, this what was traditionally smokestack chasing that defined economic development has morphed into this sort of war for talent and a competition to attract the most talented innovators, the most highly educated workers. And I think that's real, and I think it matters, but it 
it need not be and it cannot be at the expense or at the exclusion of deeper efforts to build that talent from within uh, the local marketplace. And I think Louisville fortunately actually has had for some time a very strong commitment to building that from within through efforts like 55,000 degrees, uh, the work that Kentucky Anna Works has done through Lutec Works. So uh, you know, as we note in the report, Louisville absolutely needs more people who are prepared to work at all levels of the data economy because that's ultimately what will help the region seed new companies, help existing businesses transition and adopt new AI applications. Um, and yes, also attract good jobs uh, from, from elsewhere and cite uh, what might be a new class of remote work jobs uh, in Louisville and other hubs in the Midwestern United States. Because Louisville is midsize, it just needs more of this talent, in fact, to, in part to distinguish itself um, from other cities. But uh, as Christine was just saying, it absolutely needs more diverse technical talent too that represents the whole of the community. Uh, that's so that local investments in actually advancing the data economy help tackle these longstanding equity challenges. And if you don't do that, you sacrifice growth and you sacrifice the coalition that you need, the public support that you need to sustain the invest investments that produce economic growth as well. Thank you, Alan. And in thinking about um, some of the things that we've talked about so far, stakeholders and meaningful participation and equity in the ecosystem, these are all processes that take time um, and sometimes um, involve a little bit of challenge or interesting lessons. Would any of you like to share an interesting challenge or lesson that you've learned in the process of supporting ecosystems? Sure, I'm, I'm happy to to touch on this a little bit um you know at, at a state level we could not agree more with the the general concept that the talent is everything you know being able to develop our own talent and recruit talent to louisville and kentucky generally is the key to being able to create a, a healthy ecosystem and honestly we think if the hubs are working correctly um and we can solve the metrics issue then our assets and opportunities are going to be recognized throughout you know not just kentucky and not just nationally but throughout the world and draw people here from a challenge perspective around talent, we, we've focused a lot, um, like a lot of areas have, have recently, on trying to expand opportunities and help grow uh, diverse entrepreneurs, reach out into the communities uh, that are traditionally underserved and really work with them. One of the things we identified was uh, we needed more mentors uh, from the same communities. So when we found that there was a much higher level of success of continuing through the program of developing that that mentorship bond when we really went into the communities and found people that had already been successful and had them as the primary mentors for our fledging startups there uh, it was something the community asked for and we answered with that so the louisville uh, regional hub is known as amplify and they they've done a great job both uh, diversifying their board which i think is really led them to a lot more diverse opportunities and programs, but the, the entrepreneurs and residents, they made a strong effort to try to recruit people um, who had come from the underserved areas who could then provide those services as entrepreneur uh, mentors. And that program has been very successful to date. Um, that's happening now at the university level, but that was a real challenge that we wanted to identify and address. Um, and another challenge is just in the, in the world of inclusivity, back before COVID when we were still meeting in person was how do we make the events more accessible? So early on, um, right before the pandemic hit in February, we started requiring childcare at evening and weekend events and not just childcare, uh, but also food. So that way, um, anybody who had children didn't feel like they were excluded from participating in a lot of these key skills learning events or key network events. Um, it was a major success. We launched it around the Super Bowl, um, and that really grew uh, and had, had a lot of momentum prior to the pandemic. As soon as we're back to in-person events, we intend to bring that program back. Um, awesome. Thank you. And really interesting. 
I think one of the, the biggest challenges that, that I've faced from a talent perspective is that there's significant competition in the marketplace, particularly, particularly when everybody transitioned to remote workers, right? Everybody at the same time had the idea, oh my gosh, let's go to San Francisco. It's crazy expensive there. Sure, they'll move here. And they did. Some of them did. Um, some of them moved from New York. Obviously, some of the larger cities did see shrinkage in their um, population. But then coupled with that, in uh, the death of Breonna Taylor and the resulting protests that came after that positioned Greater Louisville in a very negative light. And so it is even more important and more incumbent upon our business community and our community leaders. It's critical that we change quickly and immediately and permanently. Um, and we know that some of our employers are still struggling to recruit and attract talent. And so we're working with a lot of our employers one-on-one -on -one to develop individualized strategies to help them uh, attract and communicate um, more about Greater Louisville to try and bring that talent to the region. I just want to touch on one thing, Monique, that um, Alan had said about data. So we've heard this a lot, um, that data is held at companies in areas and sometimes hard to get. I want to highlight a program that we have within state government called KY Stats. It sits within the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. It is an organization that is designed to collect, gather, analyze, and provide the community with data about state government programs and data that state government uh, obtains. Its executive director is Jessica Cunningham. She is wonderful, happy to help, um, excited to work with people. Uh, and when we started reaching out to them, they produce a lot of reports, but were not really brought into the innovation uh, or entrepreneurial ecosystem to utilize the talent and skills and information they have. I would encourage anybody interested in data analytics um, or you know, any data that you may be interested in from a state level to contact KY Stats and see what's available. Because so I think there's a lot out there um, that, that is available to you to analyze and work with you to create particular dashboards or statistics. We've used them a lot for the metrics we're trying to create. Thank you, Tony. That's an excellent resource and thank you for sharing that. And I think it touches on an, a really good next point, right, in that a key aspect of our growth and success in the higher ed space is our ability to collaborate and to include so many groups and stakeholders to maximize that impact. I often work alongside my colleagues at the Kentucky Science and Technology Corporation to pull in more people and more resources um, than what we can do by ourselves. Um, for example, one of the programs that I'm really excited about that is a collaboration is a Department of Defense Small Business Innovation Research Accelerator um, that's being offered now in partnership with KSTC, Kentucky Innovation and OK Catalyst. It's awesome because it's open to all small businesses, um, whether you're higher ed or not. And there's just so many opportunities like that that come from working together. And so I want to pose that question to you all um, in the work that you do. You're collaborating often. Can you tell me a little bit more about some strategy for collaboration or, and where collaboration fits in the building process? Alan, would you like to begin? Sure, I can tell you a little bit about sort of what I saw and uh, some of the efforts that we actually called out in the report, uh, specifically in the kind of built, you know, broadening and diversifying the talent pipeline space that I think speak to the the power, the efficacy of collaboration for you know, really making a uh, making a difference in that space. So um, we were seeing, I think, seeing and I saw some comments in the chat about what's going on at U of L, but I think colleges and universities throughout the region are really reevaluating how their required curricula could incorporate more applied coursework in place of the conventional sorts of math requirements that uh, are present in higher ed so that um, graduates from very diverse disciplines like you know beyond science and engineering actually get exposure to relevant uh, data economy skills data economy concepts and I think, I think there's a lot of information sharing going on across the higher ed space there um, we're seeing collaboration between the public schools Jefferson County public schools and local employers towards uh, expanding co-op opportunities for high school students in digital fields 
uh, this new educational pathway in informatics at the uh, ID Plus Academy, big data and design to solve community challenges, something in a similar space between JCPS and Bellarmine University called the Butterfly Project. This is a new data science for social justice program, providing students with applied data science skills. And it's going on between community-based organizations and employers too, organizations like AMPT, Louisville Central Community Center that are engaging young people in technology upskilling and then helping them find their way into, into jobs in the local marketplace. So I think there's a, just a ton of energy experimentation in this sort of collaborative skills building space going on right now during COVID as we're emerging from the pandemic. I think the question going forward is whether we can actually uh, scale these efforts in terms of funding, in terms of private sector engagement, because I think that's what's really going to be required to help Louisville break through to the other side towards this equitable AI economy. Thank you, Alan. Christine, would you like to talk a little bit about collaboration and the work that you do? Yeah, um, you know, right now we're really focused on identifying as many collaborations as we possibly can, right? We're, we're a nonprofit, we're under resourced, we're, you know, overtaxed. Um, but but particularly with higher education institutions and with employers and then with workforce partners and with employers. So it really is all about bringing the the working world into the arena of upskilling, reskilling, training, educating um, and, and kind of getting them involved in that process. They haven't traditionally done that. They've kind of been passive and waited for the, the educational institutions to put people out and then, you know, pick who they want. And it doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> you know, um, they have to have they have to have a hand in the game. They have to um, take the responsibility to upskill their workers if they spot a new innovation that they want to, you know, move into. Um, so really just making sure that, you know, the right hand and the left hand are talking to each other. Thank you. And I saved you for the last word, Tony, because I know this is in everything we do. We've had a lot of success with collaboration. Would you like to touch on it? Uh oh, I think you might be on mute. Let me see if I can. Unmute. There we go. All right. I'm unmuted. So so you're 100 percent right. You know, collaboration is a cornerstone of what we do um, and it's really our focus. So from a state level, how do we promote that? The first thing is we made every regional hub to an asset map. We needed to know what's out there and who's out there and what's being done so that they know who to collaborate with. If you don't know that an organization four doors down from you is doing a similar program, you're unlikely to ever collaborate with them. We Those asset maps are soon to be completed. We think they're going to be done by the end of the mat, the end of the month, and that's going to give us a huge map of where to go um, and how to make those connections. Uh, it also helps us conserve resources. Again, we're not a rich state, uh, so we need to use our resources efficiently. Um, the other thing we figured out is that, you know, the old analysis was really, if you put a bunch of smart people in a room, they'll come up with some really interesting things. It seems like where we're having the most success is taking a group of people who have the same interests and putting them in the same room, similar to this event, or the LHCC Council event, Care Tech. Uh, if you bring people together that are all sort of focused on the same topic, we've seen a lot of really interesting ideas, innovations, companies, investments come out of those. Uh, and the other thing we've really focused on is, is forcing collaboration, uh, creating intentional collaboration between our state organizations, uh, because sometimes they may not think they want to collaborate or they may be busy. You know, a lot of people involved in the support space are uh, overworked, trying to do a lot with a little. So we've started to create some monthly collaborations that in the beginning were sort of, you know, kind of pulling people together. And now we see that they're excited about them. They're collaborating on their own outside of those events. Uh, and so we're just really, really excited to see that. Um, the, the other thing, and we preach this all the time, is the cold email. If somebody is doing something interesting, and you wanna know more about it, or you wanna connect with them or learn more, send a cold email. Learn the skill of sending a cold email because a cold email can get you so far. For example, we are launching a legal clinic through Monique and work that we're doing with 
KCV Legal, we are going to launch a legal clinic. And a large part of the backbone and infrastructure of that legal clinic was obtained through a cold email to Silicon Flatirons director in Colorado, who said, I'm so happy you contacted us. We're happy to help. Here's everything that we've done. Here's how we built the program. And here are the form documents. Those, those connections and collaborations can save you so much time um, if you're willing to take the risk of just sending an email to somebody that says, hey, I'm doing this thing. I'd love your help. Thank you, Tony. And these are the things that really get me excited, right? The development aspects. Um, I've really appreciated um, the points in our conversation of talking about um, the growth of equity and inclusion across our um, hubs and ecosystems. Just a month ago, I'm super proud of my team. We won a Small Business Administration Award for Inclusive Innovation Ecosystems for our visionary work in trying to make innovation a place for every, every Kentuckian um, to have a, a part in and, and to benefit from. I'd like to ask you all, what, it, what are you most excited about for the future? If you had to pick that one thing that you wake up in the morning and it gets you through your day, um, what would you share um, for, for that perspective in hub building? And let's start with Alan. Sure, I mean, I think what what's, excites me is that we're having a conversation about the AI economy in Louisville and uh, other hubs like it in the middle of the country. Uh, I think if you, you know, uh, if you wound the clock back to the dawn of the last technological revolution, the internet or or mobile apps, um, I, I think the 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 space between the start of that revolution and when communities like Louisville were, you know, having that conversation and trying to get into the game, the gap was much larger. I think it's shrinking. <laughs> and that's just about sort of technological cycles to some extent. But I also just think it's about the growing awareness that, um, you know, there are different ways to get in the game and you have to get in the game because especially something like artificial intelligence, this is what economists call a general purpose technology. It is, uh, it, it is not just something that is going to show up in the programs that people run on their desktop machines. It just, it is so transformative that it could change vast areas of the, the, the way that we live our lives, the way that we build our communities, the way that we relate to one another. Um, and so there's not a, there's not a, uh, option to opt out of this economy, right? So I think being really thoughtful and intentional about where communities like Louisville should have fit into the game, understanding your understanding your starting point, using our report, using the work that Tony was just talking about in terms of asset mapping, um, and then picking a few key strategic directions. I think that is a huge unlock for communities like Louisville. Um, and I think it's, as I said before, I think it's really, there's just a ton of possibility to do this in a coordinated way in a community that has the size, the scale, the connectedness of a Louisville too. So um, I think that's what, that's what excites me is that uh, this conversation is happening now. There's still time, it's imperative and uh, as we do it, you know, as you just said, Monique, we're centering what some call techquity in the conversation. And I think making a commitment to not repeat the kinds of mistakes that we've seen been made in Silicon Valley and Boston and San, uh, San Diego, other places that um, have, have not brought everybody along in that game. Thank you, Alan. Christine, what are you most excited about for the future? Um, I think for the first time, I'm really seeing deep and meaningful collaborations across um, state lines, across county lines, across, you know, responsibility lines, across agencies, universities, employers, and everybody's kind of buying in to the, you know, more people at the table, the better. Um, those silos are getting reduced and, and, and I think as a result, we're seeing a lot more innovation. And I also think that um, there has really been a real commitment to listen and to learn from previously disenfranchised groups 
to actually understand that systemic racism is really a thing and that we have to overcome that and that it's going to take people who aren't disenfranchised to stand up and say, I'm going to take this on and I'm going to make a difference um, and I'm going to commit to being inclusive. And I'm seeing that day in and day out. And so I'm very excited for what the future is going to bring for this region. Tony, how about you? Thank you, Christine. Tony, what do you think? Things you're excited about for the future? Well, I, I am very excited about Kentucky's opportunities in the future. You know, Alan noted it's time to get in the game. I can tell you from Kentucky's perspective, we're here to play. Um, we are really focused on finding innovations throughout the you know, nation or internationally that we can take and bring home here that are going to give us advantages and help us really grow through leaps and bounds. You know, we're not here to hit singles. We really want to swing for home runs. Um, and these reports, and Alan, thank you so much for the work that you guys have done at Brookings. You know, they're scorecards. They tell us where our holes are. You know, you've identified specific things that are missing in the report. You know, number of patents around AI, um, number of skills that, that are listed. You know, our question at a state level is why is that not here? Um, is it a question that we're just not tracking it well? Is it a question that, you know, we really have a hole here? We're going to take this, uh, work on it, and we look forward to the next report, you know, and we hope you keep them coming um, to really show you how we've grown and taking these ideas and initiatives. And what Christine said, you know, is, is really true. There is a feeling in the community right now that we are all in this together, um, that we're a team. The governor says this all the time. We're Team Kentucky. We really are coming together in a way that, that I don't think I've seen before, where everybody's moving towards a common goal. You know, we recognize that it's competitive right now. We recognize that you know remote work has really broadened the number of cities and states that, that can be competitive. We think we have a lot more to offer. You know, It's not just our bourbon. It's not just our incredible horse racing. It's not just the beauty of our state, which honestly is up there with any state in the nation. And it's not just our really solid people. You know, We think there's an energy and a buzz and a coolness of Kentucky that can make it the right draw for so many people who are you know, sitting in a one bedroom apartment with a kid paying $5,000 a month thinking I can live a better life. You can have that life right now in Kentucky. And I'm not just preaching that, I did it. I moved from you know, New York, about to make partner in a big firm, moved here sight unseen and have seen the opportunities available for people that do the same thing. Um, I would encourage anybody who's interested to contact Christine, contact me, um, and we can talk to you about why you have an opportunity for a better life by looking at Kentucky and, and coming and joining our game here. I would be remiss if I didn't say to go to liveinloo.com. <laughs> That's our talent attraction and retention initiative. You can post your open jobs there for free and it's a great place to send your friends and family from outside of the region. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Christine. And that's a great point. Before I ask my last planned question, um, I'd like to invite the audience to start um, sharing questions in the chat um, for our final um, couple minutes um, to post to the question um, to the panel. Um, but first, I'd like to specifically ask, because I think that's a great idea, Christine. Um, how can people follow up on some of the initiatives that were discussed today? Um, I know you mentioned liveinloo.com. Were there any other um, places that we should follow up to connect with you, Christine? Um, well, obviously you can follow us at Live and Lou on all of our great social channels. Um, we try to showcase what it's like to live, work and play in Greater Louisville. Um, you know, we have a ton of different policy committees and initiatives that we're working on through the chamber. So I'll put my email in the chat and you can reach out to me um, for anything that you need. And and I am also if I take my GLI hat off, I'm a candidate for man and woman of the year with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So you can go and find me there too. Thank you, Christine. Alan, would you like to share any ways that we can follow up and learn more? Sure, well, you can start by reading the report. <laughs> and I think we put the link in the uh, chat a few times. Um, but I also linked one other report that I, th I think is really important and potentially instructive for, for Louisville at this point in time, which was uh, we, we published last month, which is uh, really talking about the, the new best in class practices and how CEOs at the regional level 
can support racial equity and particularly with respect to the technology economy. So how can they uh, how can they increase black and brown representation in tech occupations? Uh, how can they diversify their suppliers and supply chain? Uh, and how can they create more income and wealth and historically disadvantaged black and brown neighborhoods? So I think there are a lot of really exciting things emerging. A lot of commitments have been made. Now it's a question of how companies can actually make good on those commitments. And I think there's a chance to actually marry those kinds of strategies um, with the, the AI data economy specific strategies that we've been talking about in this session today. Thank you, Alan. Tony, how can we follow up with more things going on at the state level? Well, we're, we're working on a couple initiatives right now. Uh, one is a comprehensive website, uh, which we hope to launch by the fall that should, you know, one of the challenges you asked earlier, and I'm just gonna touch on this briefly about, about running a statewide set of innovation hubs, you need to make sure that all of your hubs are using the same technology. If somebody's on one program and somebody's on another platform, you're gonna spend 80% of your calls each month talking about which platform is better. If there's one piece of advice I can give to anybody running a hub, pick one and make everybody stick to it. I don't care if you draw it out of a hat, if there's six to choose from, the amount of, no, there's no way that the limited differences between the different platforms are worth whether somebody believes Google Notes is better than whatever other program that's out there. Just pick one and go with it and your life will be so much happier. That said, now that we've achieved that technological uh, unification, we're building a website that everything should feed into. So if you wanna know what events are happening, it should be on the website. If you wanna know who's out there and how to contact them, it should be on the website uh, through a tool that we're looking at. If you wanna know more about any particular region, uh, you can contact your regional hub. That information is available at kyinnovation.com, uh, or you can just email me, and my email is in the chat, and I'll be happy to connect you to wherever we go. You know, we view our job as customer support support for people that are actually out there taking risks. You know, we have secure jobs to make your life as easy as possible when you take the greatest risk in history by putting it all on the line and starting a business. And we tell every single person in our enterprise that. We are here to serve the community and make their life easier. So if you've got a way that we can do that better, if you've got an idea that you wanna improve upon our community, if you have something that you just wanna say, you're doing a great job, because those emails honestly don't come a ton. My email's in the chat. Uh, let us know, shoot me an email, shoot Monique an email. We are going to be responsive and we're gonna be here for you guys. But we, the only way we can do a really good job at that is through the communication and collaboration that is central to what we do. Thank you, Tony. And I'm looking in the chat here for any last questions for our panelists. Um, in scrolling a little bit above, I saw that there was a specific question on how to involve more black and brown innovators and entrepreneurs. I can share a little bit about, um, from my perspective, um, one resource is the Kentucky Innovation Hubs um, that Tony mentioned um, so kindly earlier. Um, they are located in every region of our state um, and are also connected to quite a few stakeholders and community that are doing the work as well. From the higher education side, I invite everyone to connect with Kentucky Commercialization Ventures. We're on social media and we constantly um, are looking for more people to reach out and share their ideas um, for partnership with us. We're super excited that we are collaborating um, with different groups, including federal agencies, on how to make innovation funds and resources more accessible to everyone. Um, so we always welcome the conversation. I see a question popped in here. Oh yes, Tony, would you like to add to that? I just wanna add one thing. We've spent a lot of time talking about um, diversity, equity, whatever name it is that, that you can do. I wanna say this to any minority entrepreneur or anybody who wants to get involved in something. Don't let qualifications you see on a job posting hold you back. You probably have a lot of the skills that are perfect for the job. Feel free to reach out and make contact to the people that are making those decisions. Call, raise your hand. Uh, because I have seen so many people almost walk away from really great jobs that they're completely qualified for, uh, for a random interaction that, that shouldn't have meant anything. So I encourage you to reach out. If, if you have a job that you see or you have a connection you wanna make, 
reach out to, to me or somebody else and make that connection. Don't let anything like that hold you back. That's such that's a good point, Tony. And that's and, and I, I hope you don't mind out. me saying um, that that's my story, right? Um, so I'm originally from Hardin County, Kentucky, um, and came to Louisville um, for my undergraduate degree. Um, spent some time working within the innovation ecosystem, and sometimes I questioned um, my path along the way. It's by calling wonderful people um, in the ecosystem that really encouraged me to look beyond um, my skills on a paper or on a resume or in degrees um, to really see um, the value and help me see the value as well. Um, and so I'm always grateful um, for that example because I encourage people as well in our community um, that if you feel like maybe your business isn't ready yet, if you feel like maybe um, your collaboration or partnership isn't ready yet, if you feel like you want to be an ecosystem builder or an innovation hub builder, but you just don't know where to start, there are people in um, our community that are re ready and willing to help, and I'm one of them, and Tony is as well. Um, so really appreciate that point. And I saw a question come up from Ben Rena Weber of any examples that we can look to that may be interesting for our region. Would anyone like to share an example? Sure, I, I, I the report I just alluded to a, a little bit ago about uh, you know how regional CEOs can collaborate towards racially inclusive growth and specifically in the uh, in the tech and growth economy. Uh, name checks a number of examples. Some within the uh, not not too far from Louisville. Uh, so what's going on, I think, at the Indy Chamber around uh, uh, commitments of their companies towards uh, a, a diverse supply chain is uh, is worth looking at. The Minority Business Accelerator at the Cincinnati Chamber is really a best in class example, and I think something that uh, Louisville and a lot of other uh, regional economies are, are looking at replicating right now. Um, uh, good examples from Columbus too. So this stuff is like it's going on in middle America. It's it's within reach. It's really meaningful, I think, given the historic exclusion that black and brown communities have faced in that region of the country for some time. But but again, I think the growth of this new economy in the Midwest offers tremendous potential uh, for not just not just job creation and good jobs for historically underserved communities, but but wealth creation. Uh, the the tech economy is the sort of rocket ship to wealth creation, uh, potentially for, for black and brown communities. So I think, again, um, coming together around that, learning from new models that are out there. Uh, and like Tony said, cold emailing or cold calling people who seem to be doing something interesting and right. Uh, I just know from our experience at Brookings, like people are hungry to share what they're doing because it's not just you know, it's not just business for them, it's it's mission oriented too, and they want to extend the mission to other places. Thank you so much, Alan. And that is a great point for us to wrap up on. Um, thank you all so much um, to our panel and attendees um, for attending this panel on um, building innovation hubs. Also, thank you to the sponsors and organizers of the Future of Work Summit event. We encourage you to visit the conference website and attend the next events of the day. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thanks, everybody.